are just past seven o'clock and I see that we've got a quorum of council available. So I will call our meeting to order for this evening. Um, Karen, could we have a roll call please? Council member Husnick. Here. Council member Munson. Council member Bystrom. Here. Council member Valento. Here. And Mayor Bain. Here. With that, we'd like to start our meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance. If somebody could display the flag and participants, if you'd like to shut off your camera while you rise for the flag, you can do so in the bottom left of your Zoom tray. I pledge allegiance Allegiance. to the flag flag. of the United United States States of America America. and to the Republic Republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, nation, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty liberty and justice for all. Council, we have an agenda before you this evening. I will entertain a motion to approve or any changes. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Bystrom and a second from Council Member Husnick. Karen, could we have a roll call, please? Council Member Husnick? Aye. Council Member Bystrom? Aye. Council Member Valento? Aye. Mayor Bain? Aye. And we have Councilmember Munson has joined us as well. Oh, sorry, I didn't see Councilmember Munson. And agenda is approved. Our next item this evening is open forum. Open forum is time for any interested party to provide feedback to council on any topic of their choosing. And um, Karen, do we have any participants for open forum this evening? Um, I don't have anybody waiting, but I do have something to read into open forum from a resident. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead. Dear Honorable Mayor and City Council, before we go down the path of taxing and spending initiated by a sales tax on retail, I have a few questions and thoughts. Firstly, what future operation and capital needs will the city have that aren't covered by our current budget and ever increasing tax base? I understand there's a proposal to improve streets as present as present by the city engineer. I think that's as presented by the city engineer. However, city administrator's staff report is vague while supporting documents, lists various cities, projects, other communities, raise funds for implementing a sales tax. People need to know what specific projects this is going towards. Secondly, it is unfair to use St. Louis Park as a reference, even just to get an idea of what the $2,500 report from the U of M looks like. St. Louis Park is adjacent to Minneapolis, Edina, Golden Valley, Minnetonka, Plymouth, and Hopkins. Minneapolis is one half of the economic center of the upper Midwest and the others are thriving suburbs. People see numbers in this report and possibly blindly see the potential and revenue applied to Forest Lake, yet St. Louis Park is a completely different city than Forest Lake. Yes, there is a strong pull factor as Forest Lake serves as a central place for many of the surrounding communities. However, by implementing a sales tax, the city is essentially penalizing consumers for shopping here, particularly low-income households. According to Intuit and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average household spends about $200 on groceries and $57 for fuel per week. With the city sales tax, an average household can expect to pay an additional $679 per year because of the proposed 0.5% sales tax on food and fuel alone. As it is, gas in town is at least 10 cents more expensive per gallon, about 4.6% higher than surrounding communities. With the proposed sales tax, we can expect to pay nearly 9% higher or 20 cents more per gallon in town than surrounding communities. At this point, it's cheaper for people to drive a little further to Blaine to get groceries and fill up their car. Before Forest Lake becomes the only municipality in the Tri-County area of Washington County, Anoka, and Chisago County, with the sales tax, I ask that city council and city staff prioritize spending and think of ways to raise revenue without raising taxes. Sincerely, Matt Lindholm, City of Forest Lake resident. Thank you, Karen. Any yep. other contributions to open forum this evening? Not seeing any. With that, I will close. We'll close open forum and move on to the consent agenda. 
Council, for your consideration tonight is council or is consent agenda item 6A through 6G. I will entertain a motion to approve or any changes. Mayor Bain, I'd like to pull consent agenda item C. Very good. And is that a motion to approve all others? Yes, I'll make a motion then to approve consent agenda items A and B and D through G. Very good. Is there a second? I'll second. second. We have a motion from council member Bystrom and a second from council member Valento. Um, Karen, could we have a roll call on the consent agenda, please? Council member Husnick? Aye. Council member Munson? Aye. Council member Bystrom? Aye. Council member Valento? Aye. Mayor Bain? Aye. Consent agenda. Consent agenda is approved. Our next item is um, consent agenda item 6C. Council member Bystrom. Uh, just, I wasn't present for the meeting, so I need to abstain. Excellent. I, uh, I oh, oh, go ahead, uh, Council member. Oh, I'm sorry, I butted in. I, I'll make a motion that we approve uh, item 6C as written. Motion, is there a second? A second. We have a motion from council member Husnick and a second from council member Valento and Karen, one more roll call vote, please. Council member Husnick. Aye. Council member Munson. Aye. Council member Bystrom. Abstain. Council member Valento. Aye. Mayor Bain. Aye. Motion approved. Our next item this evening is a presentation of um, the PMA investment portfolio. Um, Karen, do you want to, or I'm sorry, Sandy, do you want to do a quick introduction of our guest this evening? Absolutely. Um, Corey and Mercy from PMA are with us tonight, and we've had them for a while now doing our investments for us for the city, and um, we want to have them do a presentation to show the council and the community as far as what they're doing with the investments and what other information they may have and uh, as far as how the investments are doing at this point in time. So with that, I'm going to ask Corey or Mercy to um, start it off. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Um, so I will lead off here. I will give some information. I'll hand it off to Mercy in a bit. And I don't know if I can I share my screen. Do you know with with the present? You sure you sure can. You should have a, a option in the bottom yep. of your Zoom tray. Yep. Didn't want to mess anything up. There you go. We see that all right? Yes. Okay. So um, thanks again for the opportunity to get out tonight. Um, although it's virtual, glad to meet with you, everyone, and uh, give you a quick update on, on what we're seeing with your portfolio specific to the city. And then just in general with the markets, obviously there's been a lot of change here over the last year with markets. So um, timing is good, at least to get in front of you with what we're seeing and how the portfolio is doing. Um, the, I think, I mean, I recognize many of you, there might be a new council member that uh, I don't recognize, but I thought it'd be good just to do a quick overview again of who, who we are, um, what we're all about. PMA, uh, we've been around for 35 years. Our Minnesota office actually opened back in 1998. So we've been in Minnesota for, for several years and we work just in the public sector here in Minnesota. And there's really, um, the, the company's evolved over time. We have three separate companies now under common ownership. There's PMA Asset Management, which is the investment advisor, uh, the portfolio team working with the city's long-term portfolio. Then we also have PMA Financial Network and PMA Securities. Financial Network um, is who we work. Uh, the league hired us through PMA Financial Network to administer the 4M fund program. And then we also have the securities arm and through that arm, we can offer some of the bond proceeds management programs within the 4M fund program. So all three companies working together to kind of give a, a comprehensive solution for, for public entities here in the state. And we've worked with Forest Lake really with all three entities. And so it's been a nice fit for, for everything that we're working with the city on. Um, as I mentioned, uh, working exclusively here in Minnesota with public entities through uh, the 4M fund program, as well as uh, the Mintrust is a no another local government investment pool for schools in Minnesota. We work with over 500 public entities throughout the state. So we, we know the public sector very well and is kind of where we specialize. Um, 
As far as the asset management arm of PMA, the team that's working with your portfolio, um, I mentioned the expertise in kind of this sector and our senior managers average over 25 years of experience. And so the reason that's critical is that, especially with investments and markets the way they are today, um, the team has really worked through all kinds of investment cycles, low interest rate, high interest rate. So they've kind of seen it all and kind of know how to manage their way through these different cycles. So that experience has really been very helpful over this last year as we've seen interest rates basically in the short end come down to virtually zero. Um, and so it's uh, a good group, 23 different people providing research, trading, portfolio management. So that whole team is really working behind the scenes on the city's portfolio to help uh, to help navigate through this market. As, as far as, you know, I thought I would give just a, a quick review of, of public funds investing in, in the state of Minnesota. Many of you are probably familiar with what you can and can't do, but it's important to note, you know, the Minnesota Statute 118A really dictates what cities are authorized to invest in. And so um, this isn't everything that's allowed, but these are the kind of the primary types of securities that we see in public portfolios throughout the state. And as you can see, you know, treasuries, agencies, municipal bonds, commercial pay. So it's all kind of high quality, low risk type of investments, which obviously safety of principle is our primary concern. But being in this sector also, it does kind of limit yield on what we can, can invest in. And so it's, it's difficult to find those high yielding investments, especially in this type of market. But really our primary focus is gonna be the safety of principle. Anything we can do from different, you know, looking at different sectors to try to find yield, but still staying within these statutes. Um, that's kind of what the, the management team's working on on your portfolio. And then built into that, obviously we have statutes to follow, but then we also kind of layer on the city's uh, investment policy on top of that. And so as the trading team is working on your portfolio, they have compliance rules built in so that they know statutes, here, what, here's what we can invest in, but then on top of that, what are we limited to by policy from the city of Forest Lake? And so those two things kind of drive a lot of those investment decisions that the team is making on your portfolio. Um, so when we look at your operating account, um, when we first started working, you know, the city joined the 4M fund back in 2016. And from then and for the next couple of years, we worked with the city to start putting together a cash flow plan. And that cash flow is kind of what we used to determine what types of core reserves the city had or those longer term reserves that the city had that it looked like from the cash flow you weren't going to need to touch for some time. And so that's what really started or um, quantified that amount that we were gonna put into this managed portfolio. And at the time it was a, about 14.6, 14.7 million, I believe that we had identified on the front end that we could really put into more of a managed account. Um, timing on it was very good. We opened that account in 2019. And then six months later, the market started to crash coming down to zero on the short end. So we took a lot of those liquid funds from 2019 and got them invested out into this managed account. So it, it's worked out really well um, as of today, I think it's about 15.2 million that's in that managed account. So we've seen nice growth in that account, whereas if it would have been sitting liquid, obviously the city would have had very little growth. So timing on that was very well. Um, so with that, I think I'll turn it over to Mercy and she'll get into kind of more detail specific to the, the portfolio. Thank you, Corey. Can you all hear me okay? We can. Yeah. Uh, so like Corey said, we took the portfolio when we started talking to the city back in December of 2018, as you can see, the, uh, the chart on the far left is how the portfolio was structured. So pretty much illiquid, it had a lot of CDs, taxable munis and some cash. And we looked at your investment portfolio, state statutes, and came up with a more diversified portfolio. We remember in your investment policy, some of the objectives for the city are safety, which is capital preservation, liquidity, making sure we have enough funds if the city needed to liquidate. And also diversity was an important aspect uh, in the policy statement. So we wanted a portfolio that would be well diversified. And then yield is the fourth uh, factor here. So really, if you look at the portfolio, it is invested among sectors that are allowable by state statute 118A and the investment policy for the city. General message here, it is well diversified. We're investing in money market funds. That's the cash portion, uh, US treasuries, US agencies, mortgage-backed securities, CDs. We still have some CDs from when we inherited 
uh, the account, but these are FDIC insured CDs. We have municipal bonds, they're about 15%. So really well diversified, high quality, as you can see at the bottom, AA uh, uh, rated overall. Uh, and pretty much the portfolio is in good shape. Uh, book yield of about 1.74%. And that will give us a yield advantage over the index over time, which will contribute uh, to enhance yield and overall performance, uh, performance beating the benchmark over time. So really the portfolio is in great shape. We continue to manage the portfolio to enhance return and reduce risk because that's the overall goal when we took over the portfolio. So overall, wealth structure duration at 2.7, very close to where the index is. We are using the index as a bogey for the city's liability. So we are always trying to match your assets and liabilities to see you know, how can we better serve that and not have too much liquidity on the front end. So pretty much portfolio is in great shape in compliance with state statute and your policy statement, and is performing as expected, as you will see in the next slide. Uh, on the next slide, this is our maturity distribution. It shows you within three months, we have 1.2 million maturing, and another six months, we have about 1.4, so pretty much laddered across the maturity spectrum. And this is to enable us to have fun. If, you, if the city needed funds, we would have money to be able to fund that. And if not, which has been uh, the general typical structure of this account, we would reinvest higher. As you've seen, interest rates are going higher in the long end of the US Treasury. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But really, we would reinvest into higher income securities going forward. Uh, and we'll talk about that too as well, but really well laddered across the maturity spectrum. In the next slide, this gives a history of what we've been buying over time. Again, we are buying uh, securities that are allowable by state statute. As you can see, we've pretty much increased mortgage-backed securities. These are fully guaranteed by the US government and we feel good in terms of valuation here. So we do have a little bit of uh, government agency securities. We have treasuries and agencies and that would fund our liquidity bucket. Should we ever need to liquidate, we can always sell those uh, at minimal damage to the portfolio, but really, Structure is we continue to look at relative value. Where are we being compensated uh, for buying or taking value? So that's pretty much what drives where we are investing money for the city. But top priority is capital preservation, liquidity, uh, and income in that order. On the next slide, this is performance for the portfolio. As you can see, quarter to date, as I have mentioned, interest rates are rising on the long end. So we did see generally there's an inverse relationship between you know, interest rates rising, bond prices do fall. So we are seeing a little bit of that uh, quarter to date. But really, if we focus on the long end and look at the past one year or since inception, we have outperformed the index by about 39 and 82 basis points. And that's because of the security selection, securities that we have purchased for the portfolio. There was a lot of spread tightening in some of these credit sectors, which contributed to total positive return for this portfolio. So as I mentioned, it is performing as expected, if anything better than expected, because we've had quite good uh, value here in some of the credit sectors that we invested in. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the economy because what happens in the US economy tends to drive interest rates, which is what you're seeing in the portfolio. Where are rates going? Where are we at? So if we talk about US economy, the US economy is quickly moving to a post-COVID-19 world. 29% of the US population has been fully vaccinated, which I think is amazing. And about 50% has received at least one dose. So really COVID is going, is turning out to be a back end and not so much of a concern. We are seeing uh, economies opening, there's less restrictions. We're seeing economic pickup here. Economic indicators in March and April are pointing to a solid pace of economic recovery here in the US, as you can see, when the pandemic hit, we had that bump or decline in GDP, but really right now we are seeing brightening outlook for US economy. The Fed came out two weeks ago and they are actually estimating economic activity here in the US to improve by 6.5%, which would be a new record here in the US uh, for 2021. And that's because of the liquidity they've tamp pumped in the system. We know monetary policy has been very accommodative, Fiscal policy has enabled households and businesses to continue to function. Markets have performed well. So really the economy in the US is set uh, to continue to look rosy here going forward, which is a good indicator. The bottom chart really shows that the leading economic indicator index is made up of about 10 indices. And generally, as you can see, the gray bars, those are each of the past recessions six, since 1970. And as you can see, we are starting to see improvements in that indicator, which is signaling we are likely getting out of this recession. 
and we might be going into positive territory in terms of economic GDP, which is a good thing uh, here in the US. So really robust growth expected uh, in 2021. Uh, next slide, I will skip this one, but really it talks to the labor market improvements in the labor market. You all have seen we went to 14.7% in unemployment and now all the way down to 6%. So really we are seeing significant improvement in the employment picture, which is really positive for the US economy. Uh, I'd like to focus a little bit more on this slide. This is interest rates for the US. Uh, the gray line is where we were back in March of 2020. The dark blue is where we were as of December of 2020. And the light blue, which is higher, like a parallel shift we experienced, is at the end of March of 2021. So we are seeing a parallel move upwards on long end. The long end is driven by growth expectations and inflation expectations. The short end is anchored by the Fed. So the Fed has come out and made it very clear that they have no intention of raising interest rates until we reach maximum employment and we see inflation rising. So we believe the Fed will continue to hold short-term rates lower, which will continue to hurt on the short end. But really because of growth expectations, we are seeing rising interest rates on the long end. And that's why I was saying, as things mature in the portfolio, we will be maturing and buying into higher yielding securities, which will be a good thing uh, for the portfolio. So we are seeing a steepening in the yield curve, which is good. Uh, and we are hopeful. And the dotted line really is saying the market is expecting the Fed to move sooner than 2023. They've said they'll, move, they'll not move until the end of 2023. But the market is saying we are seeing inflation. We are seeing growth. We think the Fed should move. We anticipate the Fed will move at the end of 2022 or sooner. That's what the market is saying. And they usually tend to front run the Fed. So this is something we're going to monitor, which would be a good thing uh, for portfolios and for the market uh, in general. Uh, and with that, I will pause to see if you have any questions for me. Or for Corey, me and Corey and I. Thank you, Corey and Mercy. Council members, what questions do we have? I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing any questions. Thank you for being here tonight and taking the time. It was a. It's it's great to see both our perspective on where our portfolio is, but then also some of your broader market observations. Um, I guess I would ask maybe Patrick or Sandy any additional comments that you would like to make, kind of tying in, kind of where we are with this um, kind of portfolio analysis and thinking about upcoming projects in our 10 year plan, any any additional comments you'd like to make? Uh, no, I think that um, as we continue with the 10 year plan, uh, you'll see us possibly having to borrow more money or not borrowing, depending on that, we'll go, right. uh, we'll take advantage of PMA's met, uh, management as far as, because we can't spend all the money at once. So that will help us. Um, we've the, the better returns have helped our interest rates, uh, the interest rates and the return on investments have helped a little bit in each of the funds that we've had. So uh, we're happy with the change that we made there. So unless Sandy has something else, I think we're on a good path with, with PMA and real satisfied with the performance so far. Fantastic. Sandy, anything else you'd like to no, add? I, I totally agree. Um, I've worked with PMA and other places too, and they've always done a fantastic job wherever I've worked. And and I've been very satisfied with um, what's been coming out um, with their performance. Terrific. Well, Mercy and Corey, thank you again for being here tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Um, as we know, these have been certainly dynamic times and um, we ap really appreciate the update. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Right. Have a good night. Thank you. You as well. <clears throat> Council members, moving on to our um, first regular agenda item this evening um, is resolution 04262102, which is a donation to the fire department. Um, do we have Chief Newman this evening? Um, Mayor and City Council members, this is uh, Rick. He is currently on a, um, a fire run right now. Unfortunate, but a better use of his time. So uh, yeah. Chief Peterson, do, do you wanna walk us through tonight's resolution? Sure. Um, on behalf of the fire department, Chief Newman, uh, he would like to thank Dan's Towing and Recovery for their generous donation of $250. Staff recommendation is to accept this donation with gratitude. 
Thank you, Chief Peterson. And I would move that we pass resolution 04262102 with gratitude. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second from Council Member Munson. Karen, could we have a roll call, please? Council Member Husnick? Aye. Council Member Munson? Aye. Council Member Bystrom? Aye. Council Member Valento? Aye. Mayor Bain? Aye. Motion approved. And our next item this evening is item 8B, which is resolution 04262103, which is a donation to the Senior Center. And Jamie is here to present that. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, as stated here in your resolution, um, we do have a donation received from Max and Lynette McGowan in memory of Eleanor McGowan to the Forest Lake Senior Center in the amount of $200, um, recognizing the hard work done on behalf of the senior population. So staff recommendation is to approve resolution 04262103 um, with gratitude for the $200 donation for the Senior Center. And I would move that we approve resolution 04262103 with gratitude. Is there a second? A second. We have a motion and a second from Council Member Husnick. And Karen, could we have another roll call, please? Council Member Husnick? Aye. <clears throat> Council Member Benson? Aye. Council Member Bystrom? Aye. Council Member Valento? Aye. Mayor Bain? Aye. Motion approved. And continuing on with our trend this evening, we have resolution 04262104 and um, a donation for the sp spring flame. And Jamie's also going to present this one. Yes, Mayor, members of the council, again, another resolution before you for a donation um, for the Forest Lake Spring Fling event this Saturday, May 1st, um, with the following donations from the Forest Lake Lions Club for $500, Bolton and Mank $200, Keller Williams, Premier Real Estate, Realty Group for $100 and Big Apple Bagels for in-kind donations. And just wanted to accept the donation with gratitude for our upcoming event. Excellent. I would move that we pass resolution 04262104 with gratitude. Is there a second? And a second from Council Member Valento. And Karen, one more roll call, please. Council Member Husnick? Aye. Council Member Munson? Aye. Council Member Bystrom? Aye. Council Member Valento? Aye. Mayor Bain? Aye, motion approved. And again, a thank you to all of our community members. These are great to see every week as we have council meetings. Our next item this evening is item 8D, the downtown sculpture placement and installation. Dan, I believe you're walking us through this. I am, uh, Mayor, members of the council. Um, tonight, what is before you is uh, approval of the location uh, for a proposed sculpture for downtown Forest Lake. Uh, before I get into uh, the location, I do wanna provide a little bit of background and context to how this sculpture came about and a little bit of the history and how we got to where we are tonight. Um, this sculpture actually originated with the beautification group, uh, the downtown beautification group. Um, this is a group that's responsible for the new flower pots that are downtown. They uh, have placed those flower, those flower pots um, and as well as made, make sure that they have uh, flowers in them, maintain them. Um, they do a great job of, of beautifying our downtown Forest Lake. Uh, back in the spring of last year, uh, the group brought to the EDA uh, a donation from the Hallberg Family Foundation uh, for $2,000. Um, the intent of that donation was to be used to purchase public art uh, for the city of Forest Lake. Um, the beautification group has worked with an artist to develop a piece uh, for the city of Forest Lake. Um, the EDA did meet on April 12th um, and passed a motion authorizing the purchase of the sculpture. That purchase is contingent upon council approval of the location of it. So we're waiting to make sure that council is in agreement uh, with the placement of the sculpture in downtown. I do want to uh, draw council's, council's attention to the fact that all of the funds that will be spent on the purchase of this sculpture will come from that donation. There are no general fund dollars or EDA dollars being used for the purchase of this. This is all coming from um, the generous donation from the Hallberg Family Foundation. 
Um, the proposed location um, that they are looking to have the sculpture placed in is the roundabout that's next to Lakeside M Memorial Park. Um, this is the same roundabout that the Christmas tree gets placed in. Um, I know there's been a little bit of confusion as to is this the roundabout that is right on 61, the big one, you know, in, on Broadway in 61. That is not the roundabout. It's the smaller one as you get closer to the lake, um, right in front of Lakeside Memorial Park in the municipal parking lot um, is where they want to have this placed. Um, we did speak with the artist and the downtown beautification group, and that is their preferred location. Uh, one of the concerns that was brought up was, is this sculpture going to be big enough to fit that space? You know, we're knowing that it's not going to be, you know, it's across the lane of traffic. Um, did have a conversation with the artist. The artist is confident that that will fit the space appropriately, and that is the correct location for it. So the artist has 100% confidence that the roundabout location is the appropriate location uh, for this particular piece. Uh, what is being proposed is a uh, nine foot tall by five and a half feet wide uh, steel and copper sculpture. Um, it is kinetic, so there is some movement associated with this piece. And I will do a quick screen share here so everybody can see uh, what this piece looks like. Um, what it is, is it's fish from the city of Forest, or from not the city, from the lake, from Forest Lake. So these fish species are in Forest Lake and they're represented here on the sculpture. Um, these different pieces, these different arms will move um, with the wind. The fish are copper and the sculpture itself is steel. Um, one thing to note is that if you do look at the, the blue that's on here, this is more of a teal blue. Um, the artist, uh, the piece that's going to be installed will actually have that blue match the light pole blue that's downtown. So they're going to take the light pole that we have on the rest of our light poles and that same color will be used here. So that piece will anchor and fit in better with the color schemes that we do have um, in downtown Forest Lake. Uh, we also asked about uh, the possibility of maintenance. You know, what's the maintenance requirements for this piece? Um, the artist has said it's minimal maintenance on it since it's painted and the copper has been treated or will be treated uh, for weather to, to stand up to the elements. Um, if we do need any maintenance, the artist is willing to provide that or to do that maintenance on an hourly basis. She does have a, an hourly fee that's reasonable to have that maintenance work done. Um, additionally, if say the piece gets vandalized or becomes damaged, she does maintain all of the molds or all of the templates for all of the fish. fish. So she is able to recreate um, fish if we do have in the event that one of these does get damaged in the future. Um, this piece will need to be installed and removed annually. Um, that's due to the fact that the Christmas tree shares a location, the proposed location with the sculpture. Um, we have talked to Public Works and they see no issue in removing this sculpture in the fall, putting it back in in the spring so we can have the Christmas tree um, in that roundabout uh, for the holiday season. Uh, the cost for this sculpture is $1,500 for the sculpture and installation is estimated at approximately $500 for Public Works to perform the installation. That's both time and materials to have the, the concrete base installed so we can get the sculpture uh, placed within the roundabout. And again, all funds from this donation, uh, all funds for this uh, sculpture, both the purchase and the installation are being used from that donation. And again, no general fund or EDA dollars are gonna be used uh, for the purchase and or installation of this piece. Again, the requested action tonight would be approval of the location of the sculpture in the roundabout adjacent to Lakeside Memorial Park. Um, staff is recommending approval of that location. And I'm here to answer, answer any questions you may have regarding the sculpture or the placement. Take myself off mute. Thank you, Dan. Council, what questions might you have for Dan this evening? Also, I'm um, or able to able to take motion if anyone is ready for a motion. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Husnick. Yeah, this has been discussed several different times, and you know, with, with uh, plenty of head nods and that sort of thing. I think it's a good idea. I really happy about the fact that this is going to happen. So I'd make a motion that we approve their um, the placement and installation as Dan had described it. There's a motion from council member Husnick. And did I hear a second from council member Bystrom? Yes. Fantastic. Any further discussion on this item? All right. 
just a quick note of gratitude to both the Hallberg Family Foundation for the funding related to this project and also for the Downtown Beautification Group for the ongoing work and shepherding of this project to make it come to life. We're excited to see it. And with that, Karen, can you do a roll call, please? Councilmember Husnick? Aye. Councilmember Munson? Aye. Councilmember Bystrom? Aye. Councilmember Valento? Aye. And Mayor Bain? Aye. Motion approved. On our continued theme of topics that have had a number of discussions already and ready for action this evening is our next agenda item, which is the FLA facility use agreement. Jamie, do you want to kick this off for us? Yes, I'd be happy to. So Mayor, members of the council, um, before you use a final facility use agreement between the city of Forest Lake and the Forest Lake Area Athletic Association, um, as mentioned by Mayor Bain, we've discussed this um, multiple times and last Monday, April 19th, the council did review this at a workshop. Um, I did just note a few final changes we made as a result of the workshop here. Um, the Parks, Trails and Lakes Commission approved this final updated version and um, is deemed you know, acceptable to the Forest Lake Area Athletic Association as well. Um, so with that being said, the staff recommendation is to approve the facility use agreement um, between the city of Forest Lake and the Forest Lake Area Athletic Association. Thank you, Jamie. You're welcome. Council, questions for Jamie this evening as we bring this to a close or also happy to entertain a motion if anyone's so inclined. Mayor, Mayor Bain, I just want to take an opportunity to thank Jamie and the Parks, Trails and Lakes Commission for their uh, work on this over the last, uh, well, several months, year, I can't even remember anymore actually, but I'm just glad <laughs> that we're finally here. So. Um, with that, I'd like to make a motion uh, to approve the facility use agreement between the City of Forest Lake and the Forest Lake Athletic Area Athletic Association. And I will happily second. <laughs> Excellent. We have a motion from Councilmember Bystrom <laughs> and a second from Councilmember Munson. Any further discussion on this item? I would just chime in to just echo Councilmember Bystrom's comments on and it's especially great to see a unanimous approval for Parks, Lake, Parks, Trails and Lakes. I know they've spent a lot of time on this, so I appreciate everyone's efforts and happy to support it this evening. With that, Karen, could we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Husnick? Aye. Councilmember Munson? Aye. Councilmember Bystrom? Aye. Councilmember Valento? Aye. And Mayor Bain? Aye. Motion approved. That ends our regular agenda item, <laughs> items this evening. We are going to move into a discussion um, section. Um, the topics we talk about in the discussion um, section of our agenda are discussion only. They are council working sessions on a variety of topics. Um, and so just a quick area of note, anything that's in this section of the agenda does not get official action and no official action is expected this evening. Um, we have one item on our discussion agenda this tonight and that is the 10 year plan and specifically a consideration and discussion of a local sales tax option. Um, as we heard in open forum and as we've seen received a number of um, communications from members of the community, um, Patrick, maybe before we dive into the details specifics on the local sales tax option. Can you just maybe highlight where we are in this process and just part of the 10 year plan overall, just a recap and then happy to hear more of the presentation. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be more than happy to. I, I think that before we do get into this, the nuts and bolts of the sales tax, is that why we're here? Um, two years ago, approximately, the city uh, went through a strategic planning process that identified uh, what the the city should look like what, what we wanted to concentrate on for the next five years. Um, two of those things really came out of it. One was the need to address our infrastructure, uh, which uh, anybody drives down some of the roads in town know is, is uh, very, very, very needed as far as the, the shape of some of those roads. Also, the public identified um, the need and the want to expand parks, to improve parks and expand and improve trails. Those uh, amenities are very wanted um, thing for, from most of our citizens. They like parks, they like the trails. And so that was high on the 
on the wish list of the strategic plan. In order to figure out how to get and satisfy those issues, particularly the roads and an improvement in parks and expansion of parks and trails and lakes, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the other suggestions that came out was having a 10 year plan, financial plan that would try to get the city in the right direction and guide it and how they could, we can afford to, to address all of the needs that we have. Um, the needs are great, uh, the revenue is not. Um, the city for, has really never addressed or used property tax funding uh, to address most of its parks needs, trails needs, and uh, road needs. Uh, most of the parks and trails have come out of development funds and roads have come out of um, a local uh, tax on uh, utilities and whatever the city gets from the state uh, as far as shared revenues go. Be quite honest with you, neither of those are keeping up with the demand. Um, as again, most of you can tell when we drive down the street, uh, they're pretty bumpy, they're pretty bad shape. Uh, so in trying to address that, we've, we've uh, initiated a 10 year plan process. Uh, we hired uh, Ellers and Associates to help us through that. Uh, we have been before the council. I think this is now the fourth time we're talking about a 10 year plan. Uh, the first was kind of an introduction session. Uh, the second was we talked about what uh, property tax impact may have to happen if we did nothing else. And the last time we talked was about, should we take advantage now of low interest rates and bond, uh, have a major bond issue? And we were talking eight to $10 million. Um, that was for information and we still need to go back and do that. We still have a lot of work to do on the 10 year plan. So what we're bringing forward tonight is just another option or another tool in the toolkit to, to possibly consider to, to fund these types of projects. Uh, as I said earlier, we really don't get a lot of funding from the state. Uh, we don't have a lot of other, the, the um, comment and citizen comment this, uh, earlier in the meeting asked us to explore other revenues. Well, with the city under statutes and things, we don't have a lot of other revenues that we can uh, provide to, to this type of process. We can obviously borrow money uh, to fund these and then uh, ha having to raise property taxes to pay the, the, uh, the annual debt on those. Uh, we can again look at the utility taxes, that we, the utility infra tax that we have, but those are pretty limited. And the state isn't really coming forward with additional money. Now, there is some hope possibly later on that the federal government with their infrastructure bill uh, might trickle down some to the local communities. We just don't know that yet. We, we, we don't have the knowledge. We don't have, uh, the bill hasn't been written. There's been no agreement in Washington regarding that. So we can't really depend on that or, or even begin to estimate that now. So bringing forward is, is what, the only other option that I can see right now uh, is a local sales tax option. Uh, this is an option that's created by the legislature that allows the city to implement uh, a local sales tax. Um, the memo, I, uh, let me go over just a little bit about the memo and the contents of that before I go any further. Uh, I've written to you a memo regarding the process of local sales tax. Uh, I've included as, as uh, attachments, a report from the Department of Revenue showing what our taxable sales amount was in the year 2018 approximately $332 million in taxable sales. Uh, I included a executive summary of a report from St. Louis Park that the Minnesota Extension Service did that outlined what a local sales tax option might look like. Again, the, the earlier comment about that it has no bearing on what we do, no, it doesn't, but it does give you what the format is and what they'll report to you. It has nothing to do with what the numbers are or trying to compare the numbers from Forest Lake to uh, St. Louis Park, it's just trying to show you what kind of format and information would be generated from a report like this. So I think it was valuable to, for you to, to see that. Um, the other item, uh, two other items is that uh, it's a, 
a publication or a short article from the league uh, that shows how many local communities ask the legislature for local sales tax permission. And you can tell there's probably, I don't know, about 20, 20 of them there or so. And if you look at those closely, and I'll get to this in a few minutes, they, they identify the, the city that asked for a local sales tax, but they also identify very specifically what projects were going to be funded by those local sales tax. And that is a requirement of the statute. This, the, you, you cannot pass a local sales tax and just use it to support your operations or your general fund or add staff or things like that. It's very, very has to be project sp specific. And so you can see by those examples, and that's why it's there, is what kind of projects uh, they've considered or other cities have considered uh, before they've gone forward and, and asked the legislature for permission for a local sales tax. Um, and finally, um, a long list of 20 some odd pages is just a, a report from the Department of Revenue showing who has local sales taxes. And uh, it's under the city rate. And if you look, most city rates are a half percent. Uh, going back to the memo, we used a half percent as an estimate based on because most of them are half percent and that seems to be kind of the norm. So we thought that would have been a good comparison. I'll stop here before I get any further if there's questions yet. Any questions so far? Uh, Patrick, just a quick point of clarification or uh, just on my part, the example projects that are listed on page uh, 72 of our packet um, that has the proposed local sales tax projects, are those under current consideration in the legislature now, or were uh, these passed? I don't know if they've passed yet, to be quite honest with you. I haven't looked at if they're included in any legislation yet. These are the ones that have been submitted to the House and Senate. Uh, there's a January 31st deadline for consideration. Uh, I'm not sure how many of them have made it or not made Understood. it. I haven't, I haven't looked at it yet, but yeah. uh, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty common and it's pretty... Uh, routine, not routine that they pass, but that they are submitted, uh, that communities Understood. submit these to the legislature. Uh, many of them do get passed, as you can tell by the long 22 page list on how many have been passed. I think there's some approximately 80 plus communities right now that have a, the cities that have local sales taxes across the state. So this has been done uh, on a regular basis. Um, and so, and I understand that we may not know final resolution, but these were these were proposals for consideration by the 2021 legislative session. So it's they're correct. current. That's okay, correct. thank you, uh, Councilmember Bystrom. Yeah, so kind of kind of building on that list, um, Patrick. It looks like it looks like some of these um, items in this uh, list of um, communities that are up. Uh, before the House and Senate, mm -hmm. it looks like some of these are like one-time, you know, one-time projects. So then what happens, I mean, do you, do you shift then to no. something? Okay. No, it, it, and I will get that, but I'll, I'll answer that now. It's my understanding, uh, the way I've read it and the way I've been talked to people in different places, that uh, the local sales tax is project-based and you have to very specifically identify the project that's going to be funded. And once the project is fully done, um, then that sales tax falls off. Okay. Now, um, the description of the projects, the real magic there, you have to decide what that's going to be. I, like one of them, I believe says that it's a citywide local road improvement plan. Mm -hmm. That's taking on a lot uh, and the, a good project identification, let's just say we just had a walk around downtown Forest Lake. And we're looking at a Forest Lake downtown plan and redevelopment. Well, let's just say that's cost $75 million to do. Maybe that's a possible way to support a $75 million downtown improvement plan by implementing a sales tax. But it would be, again, and we'd have to get a little bit more interest, uh, you know, specific and, and know what we're doing a little bit and have some help from not only elders and the legislatures, but to identify the parameters of, of that kind of a project. So. So, so, so once the project is complete, the, the tax falls off, but is there, so then if you 
have kind of ongoing needs, do you have to go back before the legislature? You, if, if you, let's, okay, let's say we had a 10 million, let's just say we built a new public works building for $15 million. And it took us at $1.5 million, it takes us 10 years to pay that off. Once that was done, the tax would fall off. And if we wanted to build a new fire station the same way, we'd have to go back to the legislature to do it. Okay. So it, it, it's just very project specific. I mean, some projects can be very broad, like I said, a, a citywide street improvement process. Um, but, you know, it really, really have to determine what those are and how we describe those um, and things like that. And one could argue that you, you, let's just say you built the $15 million, it's going to be the debt service that you're paying off. So that debt service may have a longer uh, you know, you may do a bond for 20 years or 30 years instead of 10 years. So it, it just depends on how it's all structured. And I, you know, I can't get very specific because we don't have a specific project, but that's how that works. So, so you can't use it, for example, for like ongoing maintenance of your no. roads? No, Maybe. not really. It's not okay. what it's intended to. I mean, okay. you could try to say that you're ongoing maintenance across all your roads is a project, but I, I would caution anybody try to do that. I, that's something I would not try to identify as. Well, it's it's variable, you know, from right. year to year and difficult. I mean, I, I suppose you can kind of predict out, but um, okay. Yeah. That, it's, that's it's more geared towards capital projects than it is okay. towards maintenance and ongoing staffing needs or administration needs and things like that. That's my understanding at least. Okay. Um, any other questions right now before we get, I'll go through the mechanics here a little bit and, and some of the estimates that, that came up. Um, so in order to, it's a very straightforward, very laid out process to implement a tax. Um, the city has to consider what that is, the project and all adopt a resolution that says we're going to ask the legislature for um, the ability to have a sales tax. If that passes, then we will um, submit that resolution and all the supporting materials, project descriptions, things like that, um, so that um, the Senate and House committees can take a look at it. Uh, if they approve it in committees and things like that, then that goes to a uh, legislation at the state level where, as like you saw in the, the, the release here, that we are included in some kind of a bill that authorizes us to have a sales tax. And we identify, again, the projects and the amount, the rate of the sales tax. So the legislature has to have committees look at it. They have to approve that. If they approve that, then it goes to a resolution. Uh, and, no, I'm sorry, then it goes to a statute, a, a law, and they pass that. Uh, if the legislature approves that, we've done a good job. We've, we've described our needs uh, and it's approved and it's in a bill that they, they passed. Then it goes to a re referendum. Uh, it has to have a local authority referendum. Mm -hmm. So all the voters and all the taxpayers who are interested get to vote yes or no. Everybody's familiar with referendums when they have them school and things like that. So the public will have an opportunity to decide whether this tax and what it's intended for is a good idea or a bad idea. Um, it will be our responsibility to inform the public of why we're doing this. We can't be pro, you know, we can't put out literature that says vote yes, you know, but we can put out literature that says, here's why we're doing it. Here's what it's going for. Uh, and then if that happens to pass, then it comes back to the city council and uh, you pass an ordinance that uh, enacts the local sales tax. And then we work with the department of revenue and it gets on their, on their schedules and, um, gets implemented, whatever the mechanics are. We didn't get too far down there. So that's the real process. So everybody should be comfortable that we're not here tonight to pass a local sales tax. We're not here tomorrow to pass a local sales tax. This is a couple of year process to get it to the legislature, get through hearings, get through resolutions and get through a referendum. So it, it's, a, it's a lengthy process that, that has a lot of major steps to it, but um, it may or may not be worth it, depending on uh, and everybody's opinion of it. So um, calculation of the tax. Again, I, I mentioned that I used a half, half percent. So that's 0 0.005, not 0 0.05, not 0 0.5, 0 0.005%. Uh, based on 
um, the the nineteen uh, the two thousand and eighteen report uh, tried to do a calculation. So the ca and that's that's in the memo. The calculation is based on the three hundred thirty two million dollars in taxable revenue. The one good thing, one of the good things about a sales tax um, is that it will grow as prices go up. So your revenue stream, you know, if you're interested in funding a project, uh, unless there's a recession, usually you'll see an upward curve on, on the return because prices go up. So your sales tax goes up. You know? um, sometimes, it's, you know, you hit a bad spot and sales drop a little bit, but just imagine if we had a sales tax right now and we have major retailers who deal with home improvement goods that are have empty shelves and empty lumber and uh, i mean we would have it we'd have a pretty good performance right now compared to you know just a year ago however that would be probably made up by some down years down the road so it's it's just, it's cyclical but um it, it will eventually usually goes on an upward curve and not a downward curve um, so a local sales tax a half percent uh, talking to the Department of Revenue and having that calculation is estimated to be $1.66 million of revenue. That's an annual basis. So if we just pretend we have that right now, we would be getting $1.6 million every year until our project was done. If it takes us 20 years to pay off the whatever the project is, that's $1.6 million plus as it, go, as it goes up or down uh, every year. So that's, that's a large it's a large dollar amount for us to invest in either a road type of projects or a building type of projects. If we talk, uh, you know, building improvements or downtown improvements. So it's a source of revenue. Again, it's just part of the toolkit um, that we could have. Now, when we did the, uh, the study last year, and through economic development, it showed that we have something called, they, they quoted a poll rate, P-U-L-L rate. Poll rate is a, a measurement of how many people are shopping in your community versus the average of the state. So a poll rate of one means your, your, the people who are shopping in your city are equal to what your people are shopping. A minus poll rate, I mean, let's just say it's a 0.5 pull rate. That means people are leaving your community to go shop somewhere else. And in our case, we have a pull rate of 1.6, 1.6, whatever it was, 1.61, I'm sorry. That means we have more people coming to the city of Forest Lake to shop than we have residents. Um, so using that as a calculation, uh, we know that we have 20,993 residents approximately. And that if you multiply the poll rate, that gives you 33,799 residents, if, if I understand the math. Um, so that's a per capita rate of $49.19 a resident, uh, per shopper, I should say. All that comes down to, that means we have 12,800 some odd shoppers coming to the city to shop that don't live in the city. One of the good things about this with the Forest Lake uh, model here that we're having more people come to here than not is that if you have more people coming and you have a local sales tax, what, you're, what you do is have people from the out of your community coming and shopping here and supporting your infrastructure improvements. So, Based on a very rough calculation, if we gained $1.6 million in sales tax based on a half percent sales tax rate, 600,000 of that or approximately a third would be coming from people who do not live in this community. So we have people coming in through the community to shop the major, basically the major retailers that we have along the interstate. So your Home Depot, your Menards, your Walmart and your Target, and then Office Depots, Pet Mart, or whatever else is there. Those are a little less, but those four, Walmart, Target, Home Depot, and Menards are the big draws. That's a regional draw. That's where it's coming. And 
then you throw in some of the restaurants and the other ancillary services that we have along that intersection and you've got people coming here for a reason and from re it's kind of a regional draw um, you know people who live in Forest Lake aren't going to drive down to White Bear Lake to shop at their target they're going to come here but people who live in Wyoming or something they'll come here because it's the closest one so there is some advantage of that to to Forest Lake if, if we were to implement it there's that makes some rational sense that we would ask that we are getting people who, to support our community who don't live here. I mean, it may sound cruel, but that's just, that's the way sales tax works sometimes, so. Um, and so that's that's the calculations. And what I'm asking for uh, uh, tonight, it, it, not only for a discussion on if this is a good idea, if this is a bad idea, but before we, we go further, I think that we can do what's called a lost, an lost analysis. And we'd go back to the extension service and ask them to do similar to what they did with St. Louis Park. It costs about $2,500 and see if these numbers that I kind of calculated here make sense if they're right on task. They can do a little more specific of a job. They'll probably have more up-to-date sales tax information by the time if we get there so we, we would know better. And that's what I'd be asking for to see uh, asking the council if you feel it's worth it to go forward and see what the numbers really say uh, based on a, a more thorough analysis of, of this type of tax. Again, I'm not asking the community to vote on a tax tonight. I'm not asking the council to vote on a tax, tax tonight. I'm asking the council to consider this as a tool, a possibility to discuss in the future if, if it wants to, and to see then where the numbers take us, and then we'll know for sure if that's something we want to go forward with. Mayor, Mayor Bain, I have a question Please. when you're ready for Patrick. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Council, or Council Patrick, Robinson, go ahead. Thank you. Patrick, is there any research or any way to know um, cities that once they enact a local sales tax, does their poll rate go down? Do people go, Good question. I mean, yes. Target yeah. isn't that much farther in Lino or... The answer, is, yeah. the answer is yes. In any of these um, lost studies, uh, they do address that in, in many of them. And I think, I think there's actually one in the St. Louis Park. It may not be in the executive summary, but they will address if they believe that an imposition, the imposition of a sales tax has a negative impact on, on sales. And to be honest, everything I've read, most of the ones that I've read, the answer is no. But okay. again, I, I can't tell you that specifically for Forest Lake until somebody takes a better right. And I, and I asked that because, you know, you hear, well, I'm not going to shop there anymore and I'm going to go, but is that anecdotal? Or does that I really have an effect or what I, is the research? I believe you know? that's anecdotal. I, okay. I think we'll get some small percentage that say I'm not shopping there because it's an extra one half percent. Right. But you have to look at shopping behavior and how many people really look at the tax rate when they go to Target and check out. They don't. Mm -hmm. Or the gas to get wherever yeah yeah so yeah council member Bystrom. yeah I, I you know the appeal of this certainly is that you know visitors to the city help pay for it <laughs> um but one of the concerns that i have is that it does um have a tendency to disproportionately impact lower income residents um so you know hundred dollars spent is the same tax whether you're a millionaire or make $30,000 a year, right? So, so I'm, I'm conflicted, I'm conflicted with that. Um, and building on um, Council Member Munson's question, um, I'd be curious, is there kind of a threshold or a tipping point for, you know, for that pull rate, right? Is it, you know, is it, do you see a drop at, you know, half a percent? Do you see less of a drop at, you know, less yeah. than a quarter of a percent or right. somewhere in between? Right. right. Um, so that would be a, that would be a question that I'm I'm I would if there uh, and I'm not sure that they can answer that, but um, you know, I just I think about a large purchase like a forty thousand dollar vehicle, for example, and a extra $200 isn't insignificant, you know? So I just wanna be sure that I'm, I'm kind of thinking this through really comprehensively. Um, 
and do, and, you know, potentially just have some conversations with business owners as well. I know one expressed a concern to me about more paperwork, right? And I, and I'm not sure in this electronic age, if, if that is, is, you know, is a factor, but um, for a smaller business, it may be. So, um, so just, you know, just another issue, maybe minor, maybe not um, of concern. So as, as I'm thinking this through, so. Just, just to comment a bit on both of those things you just brought up. Um, I don't know where the drop-off is, if it's a half percent, quarter percent, three quarters percent or 1%. I think that's why uh, uh, the study would address something like that, give us a little more information. As far as more paperwork and things, the Department of Revenue will be the administrator of this tax. So um, they publish what they do is publish what the tax rate is. So a business will know what their tax rate is. So it's just programming their red cash register computer once and changing it from 1% to 2% or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And so the Department of Revenue then collects it and redistributes that. It's, that's my understanding at least. Okay. Yeah. Council Member Husnick. As a retail owner, <laughs> uh, I have yeah. a, at least a concern about getting myself wrapped around the fact of uh, you know raising that tax. Um, I, I don't, but on the other hand, I don't think as far as the paperwork is concerned, I don't think that's that big a deal because you'd collect a tax, it's go to the state, you'd get your reimbursement back on it. But the point is um, uh, whether or not this would impact sales, you know, um, I'm and I think it might at especially at first, and so um, some concerns there for sure. I think we needed to look at a half percent sales taxes. You know, hundred dollars worth of sales is a fifty cent tax. You know, something like that. Uh, the other thing too, uh, I agree with uh, Council Member Bystrom about uh, the lower income folks. You know, sales tax always hurts those folks first, and. Uh, However, and as far as the, having said that, the necessity end of it, as far as groceries and clothing, we don't tax that mm -hmm. uh, right. unless things have changed lately. Mm -hmm. But um, so it's, it's a back and forth thing. And as far as I'm concerned, my thing is going to be to hear what the general public has to say about this, you know, yeah. even though it's going it would go to a public vote. It, we're talking about this for a couple of years down the road, but I'd like to get some insight into this thing besides my narrow focus on this thing is which is being a retail owner you know so anyways i have some concerns about it and um i think it's something that's going to have to be really explained well if it ever goes moves forward and uh, know exactly what's going to happen here so anyways thanks for the time and, and I do, I do have to add that I do support the study. I think, you know, the, the more we have to make a well-informed decision, the better, um, you know, so I do, I do support that as a next step. Thank you. Other questions, comments, considerations? So I'll, I'll chime in with a couple of thoughts. Um, I think it's easy to get hyper-focused on this specific topic. And I think we need to keep pulling the conversation back to the overall big picture of the 10-year plan and do some, we can't communicate enough what is in that 10-year plan and what are some of the challenges that we're trying to wrestle with. Um, so, and I think, you know, as council, there's considerations of some of these next steps and some of these very specific solutions. But I do think we need to keep going back to that plan and evaluating and hearing, you know, community feedback. Um, I believe strongly that this community and many communities just don't understand what is funded and what is not funded. And I think that there is a lack of understanding that general funds are typically not used for street for streets and that general fund revenue is not used for parks and trails. And so I think that change, as, that, as the public becomes aware that those are you know, priorities that they have expressed to us, and if we can do some education and communication on our lack of funding in those specific goals, that changes the tone of the conversation. Um, but then that's just on the project side of it. And then how we fund that there's a number of options, right? We can continue to use property taxes as we have. 
and that is a, a vehicle that we can continue to use. Uh -huh. um, this council has done a, um, you know, we have for the first time in city history approached the state for bonding, state bonding bill funds, and we were successful in that effort. That continues to be an avenue that we will explore. Um, and then some of these infrastructure projects in particular may have some grant options that we continue to explore. And so there are lots of different levers that we can push on and will continue to push on. But I think the foundation here is that there is a need that's been expressed that doesn't have a, a revenue source. And so we're evaluating, do we do that with traditional means, which would be property taxes, or is now a time to consider some other options? Based on the list on what was presented to legislature today or this year, I think we're in good company. Um, I know that other municipalities are considering similar topics because they also, and if you look at what's on that list, those are infrastructure and recreation and trail parks type amenities, just like ours, because I think this is a foundational issue that many cities are dealing with. So um, I also, you know, kind of thinking about now, you know, that with that foundation, what do we do with next steps? Um, I do, I, 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 $2,500 to get some better date, data on an opportunity like a local option sales tax to me seems like a smart spend. I'm not sure of the timing of that because I do think that one of the things that if we're going to continue to talk about other tax options, we need to be better prepared to very quickly spe be specific on what would we use that for. The feedback I've heard that is what comes, that is what the community is asking is, tell me what would you use that for? And so for us to go back to the 10 year plan and to evaluate those projects and start to think about what might be a good candidate might be a, just so, something valuable for us to have just as a communication tool to just to express our intent and to be more specific about our intent, um, especially because the law is gonna require us to have that very specific project in mind if we were to continue to consider it. Um, I think I'm just looking at my notes here. I, I took as I was jotting down. The other, the other thing I would just maybe kind of pulling us back to the 10 year plan, an exercise that might be helpful is I looked at the plan again and what, what stands out to me is that it is a very conservative plan and which is good. And I appreciate that we're being very conservative but I wonder if instead of taking just that conservative approach if there were an option to identify some specific triggers that if we were to say, if this happens, we then have this funding mechanism or an opportunity to do other things that might identify some levers that if we did have, you know, better than anticipated growth, or if some things happened that might present us with some options along the way, rather than us feeling like today we need to make these decisions, especially for some of these projects that are later in the plan, that might feel, might make the situation feel a bit less dire and also might help to um, present to the community what might be a more reasonable approach. Um, because again, I think right now on the positive, it's very conservative, but um, I think it also might paint some options if we were to say, you know, typically you have more than, you know, zero growth or some of those things that we have today built into the plan, just to show, just to shake things up and to kind of show some, what some of those options might actually look like as we get into, again, some of those later years. Thoughts on, thoughts on that? Yeah. Council Member Hustin, go ahead. Mara, I, I have to echo what you've just said, but I think it really behooves every council member to be really well-versed about this thing when the questions start coming and, and they're gonna be there, believe me. And so uh, it, that'll, that'll end a lot of that confusion. Yeah, have, and have I'm glad you, yeah, I'm glad you bring that up because right now, I think I understand at a high level what is in the plan, um, but I'm not sure that the details that I would articulate to a community member would be the same as what any of you would articulate. And I'm not sure that we have identified kind of our top must haves versus some of our nice to haves. And so I think being a little more specific on the project side of that, um, that plan might just make us 
A, help us to understand where we have consensus uh, um, as a council and what's kind of decided versus some of those things that might need some further discussion. And then also, also just to help understand that we're on the same page and more consistent communication is, you know, the, the good news is the community is asking for, what do you, what do you wanna do with it? Which is the right question. Um, I just think we, we're at a spot where we need that conversation to mature a bit. We understand there's holes, but let's talk a little further about what some of those more specific projects, because there are some of them that we just know North Shore Trail needs to be tackled, right? Some of those just need to be done. And, and I think that's that was one of the reasons I asked kind of about that threshold, you know, where's the tipping point? Because is there, I 100% I, I agree, agree about a prioritization of, of that 10 year plan list, um, getting some additional detail in there. Um, but is, is there, are there a combination potentially of funding sources that we can utilize you know, during this 10 year period of time when we're trying to get this work done. So, um, and what might they be? Um, you know, it wouldn't necessarily have to all be sales tax or bonding or a tax increase, or, you know, it might be able to, we might be able to, you know, look at a combination of things to get the work done. So agreed. And I, I think also part of that conversation back to the community might be we don't we don't need to continue down the path of a sales tax if that's not the direction the community wants us to go but if these are projects that you want we do need to find a funding source and that just might be property taxes and are you okay with that and i think that needs to be part of the conversation um and just or ultimately those projects just don't happen which is another good feedback point for us um but I'd rather us have that be having that conversation with the community with us kind of knowing what is what are those gaps and being a little bit more specific than where we are today. And I think that's one of the benefits of a sales tax is it does fall off when those projects are over, right? And whereas a whereas a property tax increase. <laughs> yeah. But has a sales tax ever dropped off? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I know of. I think I think Minnesota's is started out with a two percent tax that was going to be temporary and that's never happened so the other that, yeah. that, i don't think you'll ever sell that idea the other yeah. thing i just think from a practical aspect we need to be very aware of is this is this is a this is a long this is a long road right and if i think about what efforts have been done at the forest lake area school district on their various levy and bond referendums and just what that has taken from a community education to get the community to support we're looking at that same type of um, need of that level of education and that level of community support. And we know from experience that that has been a many year process. And so for us looking at the front part of this um, 10 year plan, I'm a little, I'm a little um, pessimistic on that being a near term option, just because I think that there is a, there's a statutory process that we have to go through but then there's also the process of just educating the community and getting them in a position of support and ready to vote yes. Yeah. We have, um, so Commissioner Miran from Washington County has joined us um, and I would just open up um, to if there were any comments that he wanted to add. He had um, wanted to just sit in and sit in on this part of the discussion. Um, and no comment is fine as well. I know that you weren't planning on speaking this evening, so I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I did want to give you an opportunity if you had any insights for us. Uh, thank you, Mayor and, and council members. Certainly, um, I appreciate the discussion. And as I indicated to you in, in an email communication earlier, um, I really wanted to listen um, because of um, some of the work that Washington County has, has done in this. And, your administrator talked about um, state and federal revenues, and certainly uh, they haven't been keeping pace. Um, the last gas tax increase was in 2008. So, um, you know, uh, road costs continue to increase. Uh, county highway state aid uh, support uh, in 2021 was 9% nine, uh, 9 uh, less than what it was for the counties in 2020. Um, you know, so funding um, does not keep pace. Um, as you look at um, 
roundabouts that were constructed in 2008. Um, uh, that cost of a roundabout has gone from 1.2 million to 3 million. Um, so there continues to be um, significant growth in, in our costs associated with, with highway funding. Uh, counties have a little different authority than what cities do with respect to uh, sales tax. We do have the authority to implement um, a sales tax and 51 of the 87 counties in Minnesota um, have implemented uh, county sales tax. Uh, our authority ex extends up to 0.5%, uh, uh, so a half cent on uh, uh, of a tax. Washington County is currently at uh, 0.25%, uh, and that's been in place since 2008. Um, for those of you that have been around for a while, the County in, in, uh, Transit Improvement Board enacted that tax in 2008 when Washington County uh, joined uh, uh, the County Transit Improvement Board. And I remember making a call to my county commissioner at that time, suggesting that that may not be a good idea. Um, the uh, County Transit Improvement Board was disbanded in 2017 and uh, our county board then um, uh, had, had to vote on continuing that tax uh, for use uh, in, in transit projects. And um, just for reference uh, with respect to, um, uh, you know, driving somewhere else because of sales tax, um, Chisago and Ramsey County are both at a half a percent. Um, Anoka and Dakota County uh, are in line with Washington County at 0.25%. So um, I'm one of those people that shop in Forest Lake. And, um, and so I'm not a resident um, and I'm contributing to the sales tax in Forest Lake uh, along with a number of other people as your, uh, as your administrator indicated. Um, I really do applaud the council for your, your 10 year planning. I, I think, uh, you really do need to, to plan for that. Um, uh, back to the federal funding for a minute. I know um, uh, we recently uh, sent a request from Washington County uh, for federal funding for Highway 8. Um, and I know that that impacts a lot of uh, my constituents, your constituents in Forest Lake that, um, that travel that highway. And we're hoping to get some additional federal funding uh, there, but uh, it continues to be uh, a challenge. Um, the county was considering um, moving from a quarter uh, cent sales tax to a half cent sales tax back in uh, February of 2020. We actually had a public hearing um, where we were considering that. We've had discussions about that for the last couple of years at, at minimum, and, and it may be a little longer than that. Um, since we um, started uh, talking about it. That public hearing was continued to March 17th. And of course, um, COVID hit us uh, during that period of time. And just with the uncertainty of the impact that COVID would have, particularly with uh, uh, closure of, uh, of certain types of businesses, um, uh, all of that, the county um, uh, stopped its process on initiating uh, or at least uh, taking public input on that. We were also concerned about transparency and um, maybe the public's inability to participate in that decision. And so we wanted to make sure that when we vetted that issue that the public um, you know, could participate um, to the full extent possible. And, and we weren't confident uh, of, of that at that time, but we have been talking now about um, uh, reinitiating um, that discussion. We had a workshop a couple of weeks ago um, and, um, and we are having that conversation. And so I really wanted to make, um, listen to, to the comments that you made and also make you aware of um, some of the discussion that's going on at the county level because we don't operate in a vacuum, right? And um, uh, and and so you need to be aware of, of some of the discussions. Um, we do not. Uh, we need to have a public hearing. We need to identify projects similar to to what you do. 
We do not need legislative authority to uh, implement the tax. Uh, we do not have to go to referendum to do that. Um, our discussions have been all around um, funding for roads. Um, and, and I would only support that increase if it were for roads. Um, uh, you know, I, I was not a supporter of the quarter cent for uh, transit uh, back in 08, and I wasn't a supporter of it in 2017. That was a, a three to two vote on the on the county board, and, and uh, I was in the minority there. Um, supporting uh, 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 improved safety, uh, increased capacity, uh, aligning with our long-term planning, uh, such as what you're doing, uh, promoting economic development. Those are all things I think that... Um, uh, come into play in my mind as I think about this, um, reducing reliance on uh, general obligation bonding, which impacts uh, property taxes um, and provides some potential, um, you know, property tax relief for, for us. Uh, just for a reference point, um, and, and I've actually got these figures here in, in, um, 2018, uh, the county uh, generated 10.2 million from our uh, quarter cent sales tax. In 2019, it was 10.7 million. In 2020, it was 10.8 million. So it's um, gradually um, increased um, over over time uh, for us. Uh, you know, since that um, that tax was implemented. Um, one of the things that we've talked about uh, over time, and, and it wasn't mentioned tonight, but um, roads are a consumable um, product. Uh, and, and so you talk about collecting tax um, from people coming outside of Force Lake um, to help pay for your roads. Um, they are consuming those roads as they as they drive on them, and and so that's an important uh, point to make. And it it makes sense that um, people should share that. I think your administrator was kind in saying it may seem harsh, but but it really isn't. I mean, they're they're using um, uh, something that you invest in, you take care of, and and as a shopper in Forest Lake. Um, you know, shouldn't I be responsible for the use of, uh, of, of some of those roads and the wear and tear that occurs from my use? And, and that's been uh, a good part of the discussion at the county level. And we're trying to get some more numbers um, on that uh, from our standpoint. So what your administrator is going through and trying to um, get a, a firmer idea on, on numbers and how accurate your numbers are, are we're doing the same thing. How many shoppers um, come from Wisconsin into Minnesota and um, use our roads um, and, um, and buy things, but don't contribute to the repair and, and maintenance of those roads. Uh, and similarly, um, uh, shoppers from Anoka County coming into Washington County, uh, particularly into Forest Lake, uh, and, and shopping that aren't, you know, paying a, a fair share of, of maintenance on, on, the, uh, on the roads as, as they come in. And similarly, Ramsey County. So, you know, those are the, um, uh, uh, the counties that are at a half a percent. I can tell you, my wife does most of our shopping, um, you know, when it comes to, to many things. And, and um, I'm not sure she necessarily looks at whether uh, it's a quarter percent um, uh, in Washington County or a half a percent in uh, Ramsey County. I encourage her to shop in Washington County and she does. Um, but, you know, in some cases uh, you happen to be, you may not have uh, an option uh, for a particular need in Washington County and you're in Ramsey County shopping and you stop at another store to pick up a few items. It, it goes back to that um, you know, how much is gas uh, and, and how much is your time worth and, and how far are you going to drive to save a, a quarter cent on a, on a sales tax? Um, we do go through a similar process, though, in submitting projects and holding public hearings and, and that type of thing. And, and, um, and I think that's something important where 
the public can actually see um, what their money is being used for. It's, it's project specific. And so, um, you know, the discussion tonight has been helpful for me to, to, to know that you understand your constituency and, and maybe how important it is uh, for them to know the projects in order to support um, the tax. And I think that's something that the state recognized when they established the statute and, and um, indicated that we as a county would need to go through that, that public hearing process. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to listen in. I, I hope I haven't gotten too long winded for you, but um, I did want you to know, um, you know, the discussions that are going on at the county level and, and uh, uh, you know, certainly um, would appreciate any feedback from you as, as you know, we wrestle with um, these kinds of decisions at the county level as well. I, I take my direction from you and, and other, you know, constituency, uh, but you represent uh, one of, well, the largest community in, uh, in my district. And, uh, and certainly uh, your opinion as representatives is important to me. And I appreciate uh, the guidance that you uh, can and and uh, maybe will provide me and as I make uh, some of these decisions on your behalf at the county level. Thank you, Mayor. Excellent. Thank you for being here, Commissioner, and for the detailed comments. Much appreciated. Council, I guess I would ask if you had uh, kind of additional questions or items of feedback that you wanted to provide. And then I guess I would go back to Patrick on any additional comments or questions that he might want to kind of address kind of hearing hearing the feedback that we've provided th thus far. So Council, anything further? I'm not seeing any. Patrick, as you've heard our comments tonight in the discussion, any kind of follow-up questions or further items you'd like to take further? No, I, I think we've got some good direction. I, as you all know, a 10-year plan, it's difficult to get our hands around all of this and what we need. We'll look at see if we can identify some of those projects better uh, and bring them before the council. Uh, it seems that we can wait a little bit before we do the study if, or did I get that wrong? I'm not sure if I've got direction on that or not. So um, I guess I would have a question on, um, what is the turnaround time for that study? Is this, a, is this a long lead time that needs a lot of lead time? If it is a long lead time, I would be okay green lighting that sooner rather than later. But I assume that that's gonna go for council vote and potentially just could be another point of conversation with the community that if there's an opportunity for us to do a project discussion and kind of go back to the 10 year plan as our next step and then consider the study after that, that personally might be my preferred sequence, but I'm open to feedback from council. I don't think that it's a long turnaround time on something like this. I think it's probably pretty straightforward and not excessively long. Um, I think that going through the projects first, that's, that's a reasonable step between that. Doesn't, it, it appears to me that's, that makes some sense. Councilmember Bystrom, I know you had expressed interest in proceeding with the study. Do you have some preference on thoughts and sequencing? Um, not necessarily, you know, I, I, can, I can live with that. Um, I just, I, I suspected it would be a little bit longer process than it sounds like it may be. So that was why I kind of jumped in, threw my hat in the ring, you know, for, you know, support for moving ahead right away. Yeah. But I think the only challenge is, is when, if they get booked up or if they don't get booked up, but I don't, I think that holding off a little bit until we get a project, more project specific. And I don't know if we can get really specific, but we can at least get a list of projects and kind of try to plug those in and see where they go, so. I mean, I, I, I don't wanna be, you know, launching this six months from now, or, or I don't, you know, the idea that the study is gonna take six months and we won't have results, you know, until six months from now. So, yeah. um, so maybe a little detail, a, a little additional detail on that timeline would be helpful to Yeah. Patrick, could you find out a little more information on timeline of how long does the study take? And maybe that's just a good data point just to bring back for our next meeting, just so we can be more specific on yep. what our thought is. Absolutely. Yeah. Be helpful. All right. That is the last of our planned agenda items this evening. Um, 
from a from a discussion standpoint before we go on to staff updates anything further all right we will move on to staff updates let's start with patrick and then go to dan um i have really no report the uh, contract with uh for parking and rental of a golf course building has been signed and executed so that's complete uh and that's really about it for tonight excellent Thank you, Patrick. Any questions for Patrick? All right, we will move on to Dan and then after Dan, Pete and Amanda. Uh, I just have one update tonight. Um, we did complete the test of council chambers last week and we actually used the right equipment and the right USB plug. It actually worked flawlessly. So happy to report that the blended um, in-person and remote is now ready to go. So we, when we get to that step, the technology is there for that to happen. So. The test went well, and I will say it's amazing what happens when you actually use the technology as designed. So we are good to go. Excellent. Thank you. Dan, on that point, we heard some feedback. I, I'm just hearing more and more feedback about encouraging in-person meetings. We heard some specific feedback tonight on this part of the downtown group. And the council chambers, is I understand, is not a good, um, it's not big enough for that downtown group to meet effectively. But just in light of the ongoing conversation and kind of feedback around in-person meetings, could maybe you and Pete kind of collaborate here on with that option in place, what does that look like as far as us resuming in-person meetings and um, come back with a recommendation? Also in light of the gov governor's orders um, and what other communities are doing. I'm just, I'm here every time I have this conversation, it seems like there's three other communities that are mentioned that are meeting in person. And I just wanna understand kind of what our recommended next steps are. So you're looking at, just so I got the ask correct, looking at utilizing council chambers as sort of like in comparing to what other cities are doing for that blended, what that looks like. Is that what I'm hearing for the ask? It's, yeah, it's, in this period that we're in right now, giving existing orders and giving that technology capability in council chambers, should we change our meeting format in the near term or is the ongoing recommendation that we do Zoom? Got it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's helpful. That provides some clarity there. Okay. Any qu other questions or items for Dan? All right, we will go on to Pete and Amanda and then um, Chief Peterson after Pete and Amanda. Uh, Your Honor, members of council, uh, following up on the mayor's comment, I would note that at the next meeting, we'll be bringing back again the emergency declaration. We're doing that monthly now because of the way that things are unfolding. And so this is a timely uh, opportunity to talk about things like in person. Uh, I am definitely aware of other communities that are doing it in person and doing it in person hybrid where people who don't want to be in council chambers or we have limited amounts of people in council chamber can still fully participate in the meeting. Uh, and we can talk about all of that. But other than that, I don't have any any report this evening. Thank you, Pete. Does anyone have any questions for Pete this evening? All right, we will move to Chief Peterson and then Chief Newman after Chief Peterson. Yeah, Mayor and City Council members, I don't have any specific updates for you today, but if you have questions for me, I'm here to answer them for you. Anything for Chief Peterson tonight? Chief, we heard lots of feedback tonight in our downtown committee about speeds on um, speeds through downtown on 61 and just it was a, another topic of conversation with challenges to pedestrians. So. Okay. I know it's I know it's also already on your on your radar. So, yeah. No no pun in, no bad pun intended. Uh, let's move on to uh, Chief Newman, and then we'll go to Ryan after Chief Newman. Mayor, member of the council, I have no updates unless you have questions for me. Any questions for Chief Newman this evening? Seeing none, we'll go to Ryan and um, Jamie after Ryan. Mayor City Council, I'll just prov uh, provide a few project updates. Uh, tomorrow, we have the pre-construction meeting for the local street project. So it would be anticipated that the contractor might start in May already with that project, but we'll find out that schedule tomorrow. Uh, plans and specs are about 90% done for Forest Hills Farms. I think they changed the plat name, but the phase two development. So that'll be in the construction mode here shortly. Uh, still working very closely with the 
representative project representatives on the uh, Hidden Creek subdivision west of the Headwaters area. So that'll be an exciting development that I think we'll see still anticipate some grading and utility construction this year. So that'll set up a lot of potential housing starts that uh, lots that we haven't had the um, availability here lately with, you know, everything else is kind of filled in. Um, MnDOT still continue to move forward on the Highway 97 project design from I-35 to Highway 61. They will, they are planning on engaging the council members sometime this summer on providing an update, you know, it'll probably be over the computer with them. Um, in May, we plan on coming forward to authorize plans and specs for some of the projects identified in the capital improvement project for the 2022 construction season. A lot of these projects require survey uh, and other things like that. That'll take some time. And we just wanna make sure we get all that work done before we get into some of the site visits that are gonna be required with public works and stuff like that. Just so we don't have a tight, strict, strict schedule and we can work flexible with public works. But as load restrictions have been pulled off to a lot of site, Private work is already started in town. Uh, more to come with the, uh, you know, the apartment buildings off of Everton Avenue. And so, you know, a lot of activity throughout the entire part, portion of the city, a lot of building starts. So pretty busy year. I think it's only going to pick up. Uh, there's just a lot of work in the area too. So surrounding communities, you know, you guys jet out of town for a weekend or something. You're going to, you're going to probably sit in traffic sometimes if you don't plan accordingly and know where those projects are because they will be limiting uh, lanes at some points in time throughout the city. You know, it's just, it's a, a reality that we face. Some of them are just random culvert replacements that MnDOT has planned throughout around Forest Lake area that's, you know, it's aging infrastructure that we, we got to deal with it before a road, they can get to a road project. So that's kind of, I know, I'll try to send any alerts that I get from MnDOT to you guys so you're, you know about that stuff, but there's just a lot of random stuff happening this year in this, this area. And then, you know, going in 2024, 25, what Chisago County is leading on Highway 8 potential project and what MnDOT's got planned in the works and what Washington County has planned in the works for Everton Avenue. There's, there's a lot of stuff that's going to be happening in town, but it brings a lot of workers to the community, uh, which they spend a lot of money at your gas stations every morning uh, and restaurants and stuff like that uh, so it's good uh, a lot of nice growth and a lot of exciting things going on right now so just leave with that with any questions you might have great thank you ryan any questions or follow-up for ryan this evening hearing none um jamie and we'll go to sandy after jamie Mayor and members of council, I do not have any further updates this evening. Um, unless you have any questions for me, I'm happy to take those at this time. Any questions for Jamie, council member Bystrom? Um, Jamie, can you just give us a quick update on the senior center kind of timeline? What are, what's, what's sure. Um, yeah, we have, um, actually I might defer this to Dan. I think he's been working a little bit more closely with other priorities that I've been working on. So Dan might have a better update on the reopening plan and can provide that update. I can provide the update. So we've met with the senior board the last two weeks or two or three weeks um, to go over what that schedule looks like. Um, we are still looking at May 10th um, as the reopening date. The senior board is on is in agreement with that. I'm looking at doing the phased in approach. So phase one um, has limited, it's gonna be open, open but limited hours. Um, we met with the board to figure out what activities are the best for that phase one approach. Um, that'll last approximately a month or so. It's going to be dependent on, you know, what the COVID restrictions are, what they look like. Once we're through that, we'll move into phase two and then phase three. And each, subset, each subsequent phase brings on more programming uh, for, the, for the seniors. Um, also, we'll be adding in different rooms. So right now, all of the activities will take place in the multi-purpose room. Phase two has multi-purpose room as well as the card room off to the left. And then phase three, we'll start look, using more of the building. Um, Jill is working on making sure that all of the sanitization equipment's in place, all the pre procedures are there. The board's aware that there are going to be changes to how people use the facility, how they enter the facility. Um, but it is on track right now for a May 10th reopen with a limited schedule. Um, but the board has reviewed that schedule and is in agreement with that schedule that'll, that'll come out for May 10th. Thank you, Dan and Jamie. Thank Any you. follow-ups or anything further? All right, we will go to Sandy and then Jackie after Sandy. 
Um, unless there's anything, questions for me, I have nothing to add this moment. Any follow-ups for Sandy this evening? All right, we will go on to Jackie and then Karen after Jackie. Good evening, I, I don't have any updates this evening either. Perfect, any questions for Jackie? All right, we will go on to Karen. Anything Mayor Bain, I don't have any updates this evening. All right, any questions for Karen? All right, we will bring updates to council and we will start with council member Husnick and then move to council member Bystrom. Council member Husnick, you are on mute. Sorry about that. I attended the walk around meeting tonight with the rest of the council and, yeah. and uh, EDA folks and watershed district and, and uh, lakes association and and our planners and most of us uh, blew our hair around and uh, got really cold, but it was a good meeting. And other than that, I have no other updates. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Councilmember Husnick. Councilmember Bystrom, and then we'll go Councilmember Munson after. Yep, I attended the walkabout and um, echo Councilmember Husnick's analysis of the walkabout. Uh, other than that, I have nothing. Excellent. Councilmember Munson and then Councilmember Valento. The only thing that I have is that I attended the walkabout as well. And one good thing that was um, nice to hear is the group that was there. Um, it sounds like everyone's on the same page with what they want to see down there. So um, that's really good to, good, to, good to hear. But other than yeah. that, I don't have anything else to add. I would say the there isn't much debate on the what needs to be done. I think the question is going to be the how, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hence the talented planners. So mm -hmm. uh, excellent. Council member Valento. I attended the walkabout tonight as well. Um, also last week I attended the watershed district meeting and they discussed the Greenway corridor, which is a project to implement more green space and it's in the beginning stages and they hope to reach out to the city um, sometime soon. I also attended the Rush Line Corridor and they gave an update, um, an environmental update, and they focused on the timeline for the project. And a few things to note for the timeline is that in May, they will be publishing the environmental assessments. And then in May, from May 11th to June 25th, they will be holding um, a public comment period and then in early June, they will be holding public meetings and they hope to hold those online and also in person. Um, and then by the end of the uh, this fall and winter, the project will most likely transition to the Metropolitan Council. Thank you for that update. Um, as you, as I think about your comments, um, so two things. So I also tonight at the walkabout had a nice conversation with Steve Schmalz from the watershed board on their green space projects. And so we're interested to hear more about what their plans are and timing and how we can help partner with that um, whenever the timing is appropriate. And then also um, as it relates to the rush line corridor, um, I, I appreciate that they're kind of heads down in this environmental phase, but as they're thinking about transitioning to next steps, we should re-engage in that conversation um, just to further and make sure that there's an understanding of what the long-term plan is for Forest Lake. Um, Commissioner Miran will appreciate that he and I have both spent a lot of hours at those meetings and that has been a topic of conversation. Um, it is a dotted line on the plan and we just wanna make sure that we at least maintain our um, position as a dotted line um, consideration and just that we don't fall off of radar in transition. So when it's right, the right time to re-engage them in that conversation that we'd be happy to do so. Sounds good. All right. Um, I don't have anything further for a mayor update that hasn't been discussed. Um, kudos to council. It was great to see everybody at the um, downtown walkabout as that project can, um, continues. Um, as you he all heard feedback, there is um, a fair amount of enthusiasm for that next kickoff meeting at the end of May to be in person. Um, and so I, would I will look forward to kind of the guidance that Dan and Pete Come, come up with on what, what, what that should look like. The one consideration again from this downtown group it, is that we have had good participation, which is fantastic. Um, I think the question is how do we safely 
um, provide a good experience, both uh, from a safety perspective, but then also just from a good communication perspective with what we hope is a group of about 30 um, and how do, how do we best facilitate that? So um, we have a month to figure that out and I, I trust that we will come up with a good plan. But it was good to hear the feedback from the group and also just the, the just the general, just positive feedback around downtown development. So I think we're off to a good start. Anything further to come before us this evening? Not seeing anything, we are at the plan, end of our planned agenda and I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> second. We have a motion from council member vice chairman and a second from council member Husnick. And Karen, could we have a roll call for adjournment, please? Council member Husnick. Aye. Council member Munson. Aye. Council member Bystrom. Aye. Council member Valento. Aye. And mayor Bain. Aye, and we're adjourned. Thank you everybody. Have a good rest of your evening.